Well, good morning. I'm, uh, I'm pleased to be able to come down today as an advocate of science. Uh, this is a good audience for Dr. Bergen's uh, discussion on plants. You guys like plants, and we all like to eat food, and I'm taking notes here on what new things I can get down to the depot in the garden shop to put in my own backyard. Uh, and when I was here a little bit before, one lady noticed, oh, it's a nice frog tie you have on. And I said, yes, I certainly have an avocation for frogs and amphibians. And I don't really look like a scientist, do I? I'm not wearing my white lab jacket, but does this make you feel more comfortable with lab glasses on? Because there are a lot of different types of scientists around the world, and I am a geologist. I've had about seven decades practicing geology, which is the study of the planet Earth, which is a little easy to study because I'm here most of the time, uh, although I do like to travel. And now, what is actually science? It incorporates math, it incorporates physics, chemistry, and biology, and earth science is the study of our own planet. What we try to do with science is to have a positive impact on humans, and our basic needs for food, water, and shelter, and I think that we can all benefit by the fact that it is through science research and the development of science and the dedication of many scientists <laughs> that we have food to eat today and we have water that is clean and safe to drink and we have shelter and the energy to help provide the comforts in our lives. Uh, science goes back a long ways, all the way from Pythagoras with the development of some mathematical theories that we use today, to Galileo, to James Hutton, and to even Stephen Hawking, who is, people have gotten the notoriety of dedicating their lives and conducting experiments and trying to figure out what is really out there and what is the truth on these things. Um, anybody have ever planted impatience in our own backyard and a few years ago? Yes, they were taken off the market and now that we can tell the Cornell researchers are trying to get them something back because we like those plants and it's a good thing for us. But, you know, frankly, I don't go out in the backyard and pick patients to eat. In fact, I don't even like to go out in the backyard and pick kale to eat because mm. my daughter likes kale and that's supposed to be a healthy food for you. I've actually learned how tasteless it is. And I prefer to plant a tobacco plant, a money plant, and a Dorito bush. <laughs> but that's science. Uh, now there's some children in the audience, and I don't know if anybody has ever heard of uh, followed the Harry Potter stories about the wizards and the study of Hogwarts and what they are learning out there, and that's magical science, and I've always loved, loved reading those books with my kids. And when you think about the development of science in our own world, you have to go back to the Middle Ages when alchemists were trying to turn lead into gold, and the kings wanted their gold fortunes and things like that, so they had the wizards trying to do some different things, and they never were able to turn lead into gold. But over the many, many years, working quietly in the dark and out of people's eyes and in hidden places, they wrote down their experiments, and as a result of that, the actual science of chemistry began to develop and something we call the scientific method, the method that you have a hypothesis, you have a curiosity to something, you conduct an experiment, you change some variables and you can either prove or disprove your theory and eventually sometimes you learn from other people's mistakes. It was a tough world. It's a tougher world today with the mass amount of people we have and the communications we have and the blitz of news that we have because even a scientist like James Hutton in the 1700s, who was a Scots Scotsman and liked to walk along the cliffs and the areas in Scotland and look at the rocks and look at the seashore, he came up with a 
profound impact. He said, the world is a lot older than we've been taught, which conflicted with the religion of the time, and he was going to be considered a heretic. His wife threatened. But he decided to continue and teach other people what he was seeing. Look at this rock formation in here. There's seashells in that. What do you think when you see seashells? That at one time must have been sediments in the bottom of an ocean. And the world changed and it moved it up and became this rock. And it developed the whole science and he founded the science of geology incorporating everything. From observations, Galileo himself, after the development of the telescope, looked up with it and suddenly was considered a heretic because he was profounding something different than was the accepted doctrine of the time. The Earth is not the center of the universe. The sun may be, and the planets circle around the sun. So these scientists, scientists took a chance by saying the truth. Now, as the world has gone on, there have been other benefits similar to that in many of the other sciences. I know no other people have ever heard of uh, uh, Alexander Fleming. Mm -hmm. Well, our world and our people's lives have been impacted greatly by Alexander Fleming because back in 1928, by accident, he discovered a little something called penicillin, an antibacterial agent which would kill infections. And he didn't even, it was a mistake. But he preserved it and saved it and wrote that down as a scientific method and what his studies were. And a few years later, as World War II broke out, the Office of Science Research and Development realized that might be a good thing. And they ramped up production, did more research on that, and as a result, millions of lives were saved from simple infections that used to kill us and our children and you can see the effects and the benefits it had to our people. Right now, the world has over 7 billion people in it. And what do we need? We need food, water, and shelter. Well, if we didn't have science doing research, we wouldn't have the food to feed our people. We wouldn't have the energy sources to keep our shelters warm. We wouldn't have wiped out the whole world in many respects. So I don't mind people going and off doing experiments and just advocating what you have as the truth, and this is what I found. Can you interpret it? Can you decide, is this a useful type of thing? And sadly, I respect a lot of scientists because these people have their careers conducting experiments over and over and over again, knowing most of our experiments are failures. We didn't get the results we were looking for. And there's a good joke about the sign of insanity is to conduct the same experiment over and over, same exact routine, expecting different results. But that's a scientific method. You get the same results, so you don't repeat that. You try something different. Try to see what you can do as a benefit. And I can think that as the world today, from a geological and earth science point of view, is going through its sixth major mass extinction. Earth is four billion years old. We don't see dinosaurs around anymore because there was a mass extinction event 65 million years ago, which wiped them out. We're going through the same thing today, and we have to do efforts and use science to help protect and to preserve the species that we can and keep the biodiversity of this planet available. Part of it is the development of the growth of the human population. As Dr. Bridger was saying, plants that he used to see in the biodiversity down in Chile bring these students down. It's all gone because people needed to build houses down there. We see the same thing on Long Island. Where are the farms mm. in Nassau County that used to be here? Uh, I'm doing research now with the American Chestnut Foundation to bring back a tree that covered the nor Northeast Forest for thousands of years until a fungus and blight began to wipe them out 100 years ago. Now we're 
are trying to work to try and get them reestablished because of the biodiversity is important. And chestnuts are good wood. And the nuts feed the wildlife. Little things like that that help make life a little bit better. Uh, my own passion with frogs has seen a precipitous decline in this variety of numbers of frogs and toads and amphibians that have been on this planet for 200 million years. They predated the dinosaurs, but they have been going extinct rapidly. Is it a fungus? Is it a virus? Is it man's impact? Science is finding ways of preserving them, and now there's even advocates for those little amphibians that have been taking survivors out of the rainforest, jungles, populations, and having them in a controlled environment like an ark, and rebreeding them so that when this fungus and virus passes by, they can get reestablished on there. Hey, I'd rather have a frog in my backyard eating the mosquitoes than uh, having to spray something. It's as simple as that. So. Geology, which is my own passion, is a study of the planet Earth, its history, its composition, and its behavior. I think our planet's a good one, and I like being here. One of the things that I've learned is, from a scientific viewpoint, is where did our entire Earth and our sun and our solar system come from, and what's it made of? One of the most astounding things that I found was studies and research that showed that before our solar system began, there was another star here. And it ended its life cycle and exploded, and that became the big nebula, this cloud of debris and gas and ices through a billion miles of this space. And slowly the force of gravity drove back together and formed our new sun and our planets. Some of the little pieces and the metals and the minerals that we have on this planet show that quite convincingly. <coughs> and what it shows is somewhere along the line, we're all recycled materials. <laughs> From an environmental viewpoint, that's a nice thing to say. I don't mind eventually looking forward to becoming a rock again someday. <laughs> but what I've learned is respect science. And today is an advocacy of science, a march in Washington, D.C., a march in uh, New York City. It's Earth Day. I do remember being up at school. Back in 1970, when Earth Day began, and we went outside, what in the world are we supposed to be doing now? Oh, celebrating Earth. And little by little, it had become a major event to just acknowledge that we are all recycled materials. And we should help and support science. And I ask you to continue to support. And don't let the deniers and the people that say, ignore it, we don't need that, skew your true feelings. It is important, and I thank you for being here. Any questions? Does Dr. Bergman can give you some more pictures of the plants? I know that's why you're here more I, I work for the Federal Environmental Protection Agency. I'm here as, a, as a, just an individual person because we've had a little bit of change in our own administration the last few months, as you might have noticed. And uh, all of a sudden, I'm not going to talk about climate change anymore. It's not real. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sorry. Well, I was also the weatherman for Nassau County when I worked for Nassau County many decades ago and taking weather statistics. And I've looked back now. The climate does change. It is a natural thing. There's been times when the whole planet's been frozen ball, and other times you have greenhouse conditions. Where do you think we got coal from at one time? 400 million years ago, the world was very warm and wet. And the swamps and the plants eventually formed and decayed and became coal, which we use today. Mm. OK, it does change. The inf impact that we're having now is, is it something that we can have done through our own actions with man? Maybe yes. And I think accept that. Many years ago, another chemical was started and being able to use freons for air conditioning. Great benefit to the world. Cars all have air conditioners now. 
the material that was used for air conditioning before that was ammonia. And if you had a leak in your refrigeration unit, that could be deadly. The new chemical that was made was 300, a great chemical to use for air conditioning. Only years later did they realize it was affecting the ozone layer, part of their own atmosphere, causing an increase around the world of ultraviolet light reaching the earth, causing skin cancers, which we still deal with now. I don't think anybody goes out to the beach without putting suntan lotion on or sunblock. We're well aware of that. Other things we're doing over the years are ramping up that change too. And I think the scientists are showing it there are ways we can mitigate it. We want everybody to have a long, healthy life. We want the little babies and kids to grow up. Mm. And we want Long Island to be here. So you keep, keep up the good fight. Mm. Thank you.